Hey everybody, so this is going to be a brand new type of episode for me. I have been thinking about it for quite a while. It's gonna be about the enemies instead of the heroes. We did a full series on all of the heroes you see on the left, and you can pick that up by checking on the playlist or you know just click on my name, whatever that kind of thing. You can check it out. What's going on here? The enemy deck of the Brotherhood. This is the simplest the most recommended for your first game enemy deck out there. Complexity level is one. And this is going to be a video all about the second Kickstarter version of the Brotherhood. And that's because most people are gonna have it. If I decide to go into a big discussion about uh, Kickstarter one versus Kickstarter two, then that'll be at the very last bit of uh, videos I make and uh, there are quite a bit of differences, but for the most part, the changes that they made are for the better, and I think you're gonna enjoy it. There is a lot of cool stuff that has been added in the Aftershock campaign that makes enemy decks a lot more exciting. There is a lot more variability to them, and it uh, will allow you to uh, have the enemies grow at the same time as your fighters grow and learn a little bit more about them through their stories. But let's kick things off where all of the enemy decks start, and that is with the boss themselves. And this is Dimitri. Obviously, this is Expendables themed. Let's face it. He's very tough. 20p, so that's 20 health per player. So 40 if there's two of you, which is normally what I play. It is not the absolute highest, but he is a tough guy because he also gets a fair amount of defense every round and will be on the table for quite a bit. If you want to pick a strategy with him, if you take a quick look and see the way that he activates, the things that he does, he's got this equip effect, and that puts gear into place from the discard pile, which means if you attack him quickly, if that's your strategy, if you go straight for him, he will not be able to get a lot of gear out there in that discard pile. When you're playing with, say, four fighters, there is a lot of opportunity to be pulling cards from the threat uh, phase from that enemy deck and that makes him very vicious because those equipment cards uh, those gear cards were will pop up a lot faster and a lot of people are saying oh i just run up and hit the boss is this game too easy well for a character like dimitri maybe it seems too easy but that's only if you have a very low player count because you're not pulling gear cards the more gear cards he has on the table, the more deadly he is. And just keep that in mind. Every time he's going to activate, so all the fighters go, he is going to resolve that equip effect and try to throw one of those gear cards in. Otherwise, he gets random defense. And another thing to note from him is retreat. Remember, they only retreat if they're engaged. They don't retreat every round um, just because they're standing there. They should be moving. If they are moving, his attack does not have a move. So basically you're going to be coming into his space. He has a lot of ranged weapons and ranged effects and ranged attacks. He doesn't really need to move a whole lot. But um, if he does become engaged with somebody, then that is the only time that he will perform a retreat. In the rule book, check it out. Well, what are those gear cards we're talking about and why are they so nasty? All right, these are the three gear cards he can pick up. The trusty Kevlar, the N40 Punisher Knife, and the ever-deadly modified RPG-7. So, what does this all mean? If he gets the trusty Kevlar, that means he's always going to gain three random defense tokens if he has less than five. You are going to be trying as hard as you can to break through that. If you're doing only general damage, that means you have to do a minimum of three damage every single time you want to touch Dimitri. So that's tough. It's tough to put together, especially if you're only only rolling one die at a time. You have to try to get a lot of equipment or something else to go through. If you had to do this solo with someone like Natalia, it could be very difficult, uh, especially to try to defeat him in the early game. So this is something that you don't want to have out all the time. Natalia could disarm it, but as soon as he activates, if it goes in the discard pile, he could pull it right back out for the next round, almost losing nothing. So 
these are things to think about. It'd be very difficult. You only have three of those disarms in your, your card stack, so it could be a while before you cycle to another one. That could be rough. So the next one is his melee attack. This is the N40 Punisher, and he'll attack everyone engaged with him. This goes into his um, tactic area, hit the enemy play area, which means he'll have his regular attack, and then he gets an additional attack. What is he going to do the damage of? Well, if you look at his regular boss card, he deals four enemy dice. So that is eight enemy dice worth of damage. Uh, tough, right? And what makes it worse? Each fighter engaged with him. So that's everybody around him. That's your allies. That's you. That's your buddies. Your buddies' allies. And any objectives that may be counting as a fighter. So... Yeah, it could be pretty deadly if he has this out there. But if he doesn't attack you, then uh, the card's just going to keep sticking around and uh, you're still going to get hit by it. Like he's going to throw it at you, which is going to cause it to shuffle back into the deck and it's going to deal you direct damage. You can't block it. There's nothing you can do about it. And that whittling down on you is bad. It sucks. So if you did disarm it, that just means you're going to be popping this back into play very quickly and dealing yourself enemy dam or uh, direct damage. Okay, the bad one, the one that everyone's afraid of, the modified RPG-7. So it requires power to be placed on it, so be sure to be able to keep track of that. And um, this is a very special type of attack. If you get hit then every figure, which includes enemies, includes Dimitri himself, because they're all figures. If it wasn't everybody, then it would be specific. It would say minion, enemy, or fighter. This says figure. So you're going to discard a power, uh, basically power being a reload, to uh, deal everybody within four spaces some extra damage. Then you have to discard something. So you've been so impacted and hurt by the concussive force of that rocket hitting you that you've lost a tactic card or some other card that you have in play. This can be devastating for certain strategies, especially early game when you don't have a lot of control over what's in your hand. You don't have a lot of options in your hand and this could completely wreck you. So not only is it a powerful attack that could wipe out all of your allies, especially if you don't have a lot of defense up front, then it's also gonna be getting rid of cards that you desperately need. And if all of that is not bad enough, fully loaded is a tactic he can have in play that makes it so if you're not engaged with him, you're going to be taking general damage for every gear that he has on him. So it's as if he is shooting you from cover somewhere and uh, getting extra bullets and whatnot from those gear cards that he has in place. If there are no gear cards, then you're gonna resolve the equip effect, which means you're gonna be doubly putting gear back in play. So even if you got rid of, uh, on one turn, one piece of gear, let's say you got rid of three pieces of gear, his regular equip effect that is gonna take place from his regular action is gonna kick in. He'll equip the, uh, the gear card and then fully loaded will take place. He'll equip that gear card. And then the rest of his cards, which are now in play, are going to start going through their activate cycle. So they go left to right. If you didn't have anything in play before, now you have more things to the right of fully loaded. So now you're getting hit with RPG. Now the Kevlar vest is coming into play. So it's like they never disappeared. There's uh, it completely uh, dissolves, <laughs> it completely gets rid of and negates your getting rid of his, uh, his other cards. One of the cool changes for Natalia is with the disarm and now it's, you can get rid of a card in play that's controlled, not necessarily just a gear card. So if you are having problems, someone like Natalia can get rid of fully loaded first and then start working through getting rid of the gear stuff. So those are some strategies if you're having trouble with this. Otherwise, speed. Hit him fast. Hit him as hard as you can, as quickly as you can. And uh, 
yeah. Let's look at some other cards that might pop in. Now let's take a look at the minions, the real life blood of an enemy deck. And we have Anastasia, Boris, and Drago. So Anastasia is one of the five color uh, type of enemies. She has fairly low health, not a strong attack on her own. But the cool thing that she's able to do to hurt you is everything's at range. <laughs> so if she's unengaged and her movement should be trying to keep her unengaged as much as possible, she's going to be dealing direct damage. If you had five of these out on the table and you're not getting rid of them in time, that's five direct damage per round. And if she's unable to, then she's going to move. Otherwise, she just kind of stays in place and acts as a sniper and tries to be within those six spaces. It is very difficult for a fighter to be able to move that much to get engaged with her to stop those kinds of attacks. Um, but it's not impossible. You can use your sprint action, whatever it is that you think that you need to do. But she will retreat if you do become engaged with her. And this is one of the best cards to kind of explain uh, how retreat works. It says if engaged retreat, they only retreat if they're engaged. Keep that part in mind. And she'll hit you and then bounce away. Then we have Boris. Boris is kind of unique in that he obviously Zangief, right? From the original Street Fighter 2. And he is going to hold you, he's going to grab you, bear hug you, hold you in place. The only way out would be to give up a grapple defense token. So it's not like you're just getting hit. You have to discard grapple defense and you will not get power for it. So just keep that part in mind. He is medium strength with six health and he advances to become within uh, attack range. So most of the time you want the uh, enemies to not move to become engaged with you. In his case, he is going to be advancing so that he can become engaged with you and try to attack. He gains a plus one attack value if he didn't move. So if he was stationary, holding you, grappling you, then he gets more powerful. That can be a problem. So you have to decide if you can run away from him quickly enough or if you're just going to take the uh, the hit. Sometimes you want to take the hit in order to increase power, especially late in the game. But uh, at the beginning, he's one you definitely want to run away from. Then we have Drago, the big bad guy. And he is far more defensive than any of the other minions, I think, in the game. In the sense that he has an actual damage reduction instead of just blocking against direct damage. And... He does advance, he tries to get towards fighters to be able to attack, and otherwise he gains defense tokens, so he's always got some type of defense. Being this big, hulking monster of a human being, he has a lot of health. 8 health, hard to deal with in a single turn, especially if he's picking up all these random defense tokens if he's been out on the table a while. You may want to think about just attacking him as quickly as you can, and then trying to run away from him if you can. Um, he does have attack of three. You should be able to deal with it uh, after a couple of rounds. Maybe you'll kite him around a little bit. But if he starts getting in combination with Anastasia, who's pelting you from a distance, and Boris, who's going to be holding you in place and doing all this extra grapple damage, then uh, you're going to be in a world of hurt. A lot of fighters don't have grapple damage as their main attack and that means that they have to pick up the uh, defense tokens either through some card effect that allows them to choose what they're um, going to be doing what their uh, defense is going to be or spending actions and hoping that one of those random rolls is going to be for grapple they're uh, keeping in mind that when you roll for your attack if you do get a shield you only get the defense token specifically of the type of attack you did. This is something that can be mitigated with um, someone like Natalia, who I keep mentioning because she does general attacks, general damage attacks, which allows her to always choose what her defense tokens are going to be. But uh, for anyone else, it could be a little bit tricky as these guys are hitting you. Then we have another style of card that pops into play, and these are the events. And each of these is tied to the minions. So as you can see with extra ammo for Anastasia, hold them back for Boris, and Steely Defense for Drago. They power up 
for each of the minions still in play. So the longer you are fighting, the more minions are going to be out on the table, the more damage these are going to do to you. So extra ammo gives extra direct damage for each Anastasia in play for every single fighter. So if you've been protecting somebody, she's just pelting away with the extra guns. It doesn't matter where they are on the table, there is no limit. It's not within six, it's just that they're on the table. This could be an instant kill and ruin your game if you are not mitigating those minions. If nobody is in play for Anastasia, then Dimitri is going to deal each fighter two direct damage anyway. So there's no way out of getting hit for a minimum of one direct damage when this comes out on the table. Same thing is, uh, same way, uh, you're going to get Boris doing extra attacks and gaining plus one grapple result. That is in addition to his normal attack. So he's going to hit for two and then get a third or extra grapple uh, result added to it. So you're going to be taking at least four damage when this happens. Otherwise, Dimitri's going to be powered back up with those random defense tokens. This one isn't as bad because it's not going to end your game right away. That Anastasia one popping out could really just ruin everything. It says each fighter again on Anastasia. And all of your allies are fighters. All of the objectives that say that they uh, act as a fighter, they're going to get hit too. And that's definitely going to ruin any chances you had of trying to save a character or waiting for health or anything like that. Yeah. Steely defense. Okay. Each fighter activates a Drago card in their threat area if able. So this is very similar to each Boris in play immediately attacks. Um, in this one, it just kind of has it tied to what's in your threat area, but they do the same thing. And otherwise... Uh, Dimitri is going to gain six defense. So, yeah, it's uh, it's rough. Any of these pop out, you're going to be hurt. How do you get rid of these? Well, you could have Yingwa constantly um, having things discard from the top of the enemy deck, which is nice. It is uh, one way to try to get rid of these events. I would be most worried, like I said, about extra ammo. And if you end up liking those minions and other folks, then you might want to use them as an ally. There is no Boris ally. I didn't forget it. There just isn't one. And what can you do? Well, let's look at this. Anastasia, again, low health, but she gets to move around and she can still target enemy within six spaces of her. She gets to do two attacks, which is on the low end, but at least it's ranged and that's not too bad. Dimitri himself as an ally is pretty cool to have. They are focusing specifically on uh, basically his range attacks like the RPG or anything like that. Each enemy within two spaces of the target instead of the four that would happen if he was firing the RPG. So it's like RPG light is going to be taking an extra general damage. So in addition to the three on the main target, he's going to be firing away and uh, hitting in a large area. Uh, an extra general damage it specifically says unlike the rpg enemy though so you can have your uh, friends in there and only hit your foes drago he's going to move a little bit and attack gaining a random defense token i would have liked to have seen him be able to attack for a little bit more considering how he's so big but otherwise he's a good damage soak since he has one of the higher healths of 10 and uh it's okay then looking at their rival sides, they do pretty much the same thing that they do as regular minions and bosses. Anastasia gets a little bit more health, but she's still going to be dealing direct damage within six and attacking. Dimitri, 14 health is a lot for a rival, so he is pretty beefy in that respect. He is going to be attacking everyone around him still, and he's still going to be doing the same type of attack he does on his ally side and that he's hitting and doing general damage as a splash. This time it says each fighter. So unlike his regular boss, he's only going to be doing damage to you and your allies. And after he's done attacking everybody around him, just like if he had that uh, knife out, then he's going to go ahead and uh, retreat away so that he can hit you with the guns again a little later. Drago, 
he is going to be reducing that damage exactly the same as if he was uh, part of a minion. Basically everything about him is the same if he was a minion. So if you thought he was tough before, well now he's back. Then at the beginning of the video I talked about how these could be upgraded using their own story showdown decks. And this is a new thing that happens in Aftershock. So if you didn't get Aftershock, you're going to have to look around and see where you can pick these cards up. I'm not going to spoil too much. I'm just going to explain a little bit how they're different. So obviously you're going to get a card like this that is going to give you some information about the story. And you put them in play just like if they were a hero story. You can put them in concurrently with the hero story. That part is totally up to you. I think if you end up upgrading the villains as part of their story, I like leaving the upgrades for the heroes in. I would leave the upgrades for the villains in. What do those upgrades mean? Well, as you can see, just like with the heroes, you get the little gold accent and the up triangle in order to indicate that it has been upgraded. He has 20% more health per fighter, so that makes him a little bit more deadly. And his attack has changed. When he is just a regular boss, then he attacks one person and it resolves an equip effect and retreats one space. He's not retreating anymore. He's staying in the fight and he's attacking everybody engaged with him. And only if he's not uh, attacked uh, or doesn't attack any other fighters, then he resolves his equip effect. So what does it give him? Well, this time you're just going to get right off the top two random defense tokens so that's going to happen whether or not he has gear and then you're going to put whatever the topmost gear is into play from the discard pile so he gets extra buffs on everything that he could have done that makes him a lot more deadly foe it means that you're not going to be as able to be able to just punch him in the face and knock him down he's going to be significantly more deadly and there are upgrade cards for everything but the minions. So all of those events, they have their own upgrades. And just like as if you played a hero uh, fight, um, a hero story, you will be getting upgrade cards whenever you slot in one of these showdowns. And a couple of them are gonna have their own stage setups, but for the most part, they're gonna be able to slot in with whatever story you're playing at the same time. So story-wise, a lot of that stuff can get confusing if you're trying to follow along with everybody as they do stuff. But I think if you've already played through um, the hero stories themselves, which I think is a lot more interesting, then, uh, or as you go through those hero stories, maybe you're like, oh, I've played so many times against the Brotherhood. Well, this can mix things up and make them far more deadly, far more interesting and keep you interested as you continue to play all of the, I don't know, what was it like? Up to septillion numbers, like several septillion iterations of this game. There's so many things to do. The Brotherhood's really popular in a lot of the cards because he, it's a core set and that means everybody's going to have it. And uh, you know, that's when you're building a game, you gotta go with the things that you know people have if you don't have all these redemption packs you don't have all the other upgrades and other stuff then uh, you just gotta slot these guys in and that can be a little bit taxing uh, and feel a little bit boring as you get to the end and that's what these showdown cards help to mitigate and I think it's an awesome inclusion and a really really great reason why people should be picking up Aftershock. And that's all I've got to say about the Brotherhood. I hope this has helped with any questions you may have had about, you know, what they do and how to play certain rules and all that kind of cool stuff. And uh, hopefully you found ways to keep it interesting. If you have any comments, questions, concerns, you think that I got something wrong, put wherever you found the thing to be wrong in the rule book in the comments so that other people can see it because I might not get it to every comment, but you know, people can see whatever the thing is for as long as YouTube exists, which will be the end of time. Come on, let's face it. And if you have any other things to say, I do have another channel where I talk about every single RPG, board game, tabletop game, war, skirmish, whatever cool stuff, 3D models and 3D printing that comes out on a weekly basis. 
and try to keep people informed and uh, you can check it out in the description and uh, go from there otherwise you can like the playlist and see what other stuff i've come up with this is the first video i've done i think close to 50 videos now and it will link to all the stuff i did for the first kickstarter if you have any immediate questions if i haven't gotten an updated video for it yet otherwise i hope you guys enjoy this new format and uh we'll go to the next stuff